Good afternoon. Welcome to the case studies of education and open with the Volt Cooperative. Scott Brandon Smith here is a credit underwriter and a solidity developer. Our agenda today is uh, defining exploitation. And then we're going to find out what's at stake when open source gets exploited. We're going to go over the open source governance methods that you're familiar with, and then maybe some that you're not, which would be what I'm calling the light triad and the dark triad. And then we're going to go over open source community structures, and then we finally get to some case studies. All right. So <clears throat> before I go to the next slide, who all wants to define exploitation? Who wants to take a stab? No wrong answers. OK. Nope. OK. Yeah, so it's a, a hard thing to define. So we have Richard Wolf, his definition, and I think it's a, a good one. Exploitation is a production of a surplus that's appropriated and distributed by those other than its producers. Uh, so kind of an academic, but here's a, a, an illustration. So if we are all carpenters, it's 10 of us, and we decide to make some chairs, chop down the trees, make some chairs, we make 10 of them, okay? There's five of us. We go out to the market. We sell eight of the chairs. Two of those chairs that are left, that's the surplus. And um, exploitation is when someone says, hey, those chairs, those two chairs, don't worry about those. Give those to me. Uh, or they just take them or something like that. That is exploitation. It's when someone who um, didn't, when they weren't involved and they're part of it and you don't get a chance to vote on where the, the surplus, some people would call it profit, but the extra <clears throat> goes. So who is it that does that, that exploitation? So this is where we start to get a little bit more controversial. So there's a class called the professional managerial class. Uh, here's a definition by Barbara Einrich. It's made up of salaried mental workers who do not own the means of production. And essentially they reproduce capitalist culture and capitalist class relations. The way that I think about the professional managerial class relates to open source is they're basically that those two chairs, the extra, they're basically like Jedi mind trick. These are not the droids you're looking for. They're good at saying, don't look at the surplus. Don't worry about that. So you don't ask about it. You don't think about it. You don't reason about it. You don't know what the word exploitation means. All of that. The uh, professional managerial class, their skill set is that Jedi mind trick. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that professional managerial class is basically us. We're the ones that are we're good at doing that. We do that to each other, to ourselves. We don't even know it. Um, so it's something to be aware of. And we're going to come back to that. But when we talk about capitalism, what are we saying? Someone was saying earlier in the keynote, um, they want to be, is it safe to be anti-capitalist? And I always wonder what people mean when they say capitalist. I don't know what they mean. A lot of people I talk to, they say markets. That's it. Well, you know, there were markets during slavery. There were slave markets. And that's before Adam Smith. There's markets in the Gilded Age, you know, with guilds. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, capitalism. Um, entrepreneurship. Here we have a definition of David Ellerman. It's free markets is part of it. Entrepreneurship is part of it. Private property is part of it, but then this one on the bottom right, this employer-employee relationship or employer-employee contract, that part there is where I think the debate begins and ends. And whatever it is that you want to call those three, private property, free markets, entrepreneurship, all that stuff, but without this other relationship, if you want to call it socialism or you want to say it's still capitalism, it doesn't really matter. But... When we're talking about exploitation, 
right? Remember, if you don't get a chance, you made the chairs and you don't get a chance to decide on where the surplus goes, that's exploitation. This employer-employee relationship, this is the thing that says, no, you don't get a chance. If you are the employer, if you are part of, um, let's say if you're part of a firm that where it's a one person, one vote, or everyone gets to participate in decision-making and all that, then it's not exploitation. So um, it, it, the word capitalism oftentimes gets thrown around, but if we reason about a little bit more with this, I think we can tease out a little bit of a better discussion. Now, what's at stake? What are we talking about, the surplus and open source? All right, so we have a book here, Working in Public. One of the things that they pointed out was that attention, well, first, uh, open source in general, people think of it as um, you know, a public good. Uh, it's a non-rival in economic jargon uh, resource. So basically, um, when one person uses it, it doesn't hurt anyone else. So just go ahead and let everyone use it. Well, there are a couple things within the open source community during the production of open source that are non-rival, uh, meaning one person gets it, another person gets less of it. Attention is one. And that relates to later to the management of what the products of open source. So attention is one of the products of open source. Of course, you got donations, money that's easy to reason about. You also have the decision-making power. Well, why would that be important? Well, you know, maybe you're doing things like um, making software that grades other high value software and people are incentivized to manipulate that. They want to have power over that. They don't want to say, oh, you know, my software doesn't work, that kind of thing. All kinds of examples like that. Um, tests, someone wants to make a, 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 a test and they're in their vendor and they want to say within the test, hey, let's go ahead and put some vendor specific questions in the test. You know, who is it that gets to decide to do that? All right, so now let's talk about something that people are probably familiar with. We got the art of community, uh, Jono Bacon. You got the three different ways of governing. So this decision-making in open source, you got benevolent dictatorship on the top, this dictatorial charismatic leadership. Then you have enlightened dictatorship, which is, um, I guess, KDE is an example that General Bacon uh, used. Basically, there isn't a, a leader uh, in this form, but it's more of a meritocracy and it's based off of reputation. Then you have delegated governance. So this is where the way he defines it. You have multiple teams that come together and form a governing body, and it's going to be closer to maybe a democracy. Now, my uh, pushback on this is, you know, everything can be perverted. Now you have the dark triad. So that was a light triad. Here's a dark triad. So, um, here you have... Maybe people are familiar with uh, Giannis Varoufakis' book, Techno Feudalism. I'm saying that the benevolent dictator, when it turns sour, it's going to become more of a feudal lord. And we're going to talk about some of the properties of what an open source project looks like that. Then you have enlightened dictatorship, it turns into banana republics. So this is where you're uh, creating uh, public governments and these types of things. And then you have uh, another book, which I think is the best book on how to hack democracy. It's the, uh, Democracy Inc, uh, Inverted Totalitarianism or Managed Democracy by Sheldon Wolin. Uh, both, all, all three of these, I think are things to keep in the back of the mind. If you have a, uh, a positive way to set up some type of structure, it can always be perverted, hack, that type of thing. And so knowing what things look like when they get exploited is a good thing to try to fight back. So here's some of these traits. Techno-feudalism, uh, I will say within these different traits, one, there's a spectrum of legitimacy uh, when, when talking about governance. So within uh, feudalism, it's the least legitimate the citizens or the serfs, they're going to storm the castle. They don't, they don't ever think that anything is legitimate. Um, you know, so they're just waiting for the right time, right? It's the most authoritarian. 
stifles innovation. I think Yanis Varoufakis has a good uh, definition of feudalism here, basically. And all things that are property would essentially be given by birthright or something like that, really not off of merit or work or innovation. And so the main source of exchange is rent. Right? So now Banana Republic, the uh, thin veneer of legitimacy. So if you think here, pay to, um, you think here, a uh, puppet governments like in Chile, Nicaragua, that type of thing, some of, of that, you, uh, this is a really uh, good book about that, it's Gangsters of Capitalism. Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll have is some type of sponsor. So in real life, it would be, say, the United States, right? And we'll say, hey, we want this regime, which well, let's have a little um, election there or something like that. But we're going to fund one person, hurt another person, make sure scare them off, whatever. But it's a pay to play. And then what you get out of that is a privileged trade status. So literally, you get to trade the bananas, you know, Honduras or wherever it was, or Nicaragua, Panama, these types of places. Now, inverted totalitarianism is the most legitimate, seemingly most legitimate. It's a managed democracy. You have elections, but uh, a counterintuitive truth within political science for contemporary democracy, the view is that you actually want apathetic citizens. You don't want people voting because one of the outcomes of that is you could create uh, an, a, what happens is uh, the country can turn or this nation state can turn into a th authoritarian scheme. It's what they, they point, literally point at uh, Germany and say they were a democracy and then they turned into authoritarianism. Uh, very counterintuitive, but that's one group. It's the majority view. Uh, another group is the participatory uh, uh, political scientists, and they believe, oh, yeah, no, we should try to get citizens participating, decision making, these types of things. What nor what most people think. Uh, so, within inverted totalitarianism, the goal is to, uh, within this decision making structure, you, the professional managerial class are actually trying to promote apathy, pay attention, maybe four times, once every four years some type of thing like that and then turn around yeah go back to your go back to your job um partial participation we're going to talk about this partial participation is when you have two groups uh that influence each other but one group has decision making power the final decision making power that that's it's very powerful for getting buy-in um revolving doors we all know about this so you're going to be the director of the fda and you coming from Pfizer and you go back to Pfizer after you're done, that kind of thing. Um, same thing within open source, you can have somebody within, uh, that's a representative within a working group. They're coming from a big company and then they go and they're supposed to be representing the user group or, or people in a working group. And then they, you know, they're doing things for the big company. You, and this is particularly problematic when you there are things where it's like a regulatory capture if you're working on systems that are dealing with grading something. Um, that's a way where it can benefit the, the sponsor. And then you have filibuster. Business as usual come in, you know, there's some decisions that you want to forestall. People just bring up things that don't matter or just keep talking and try to make it to where important decisions that don't benefit some corporate entity uh will not get uh made all right so how do we assess the distribution of assets fairly here's a, a couple different places you can look so distributed justice again we're talking about exploitation specifically here so how does it that you get it to where the people who work on something so in this case open source get to decide on where the surplus goes that would be a great book for that would be robert Dahl. Uh, preface for Economic Democracy. Fair Divisions, very much a game theory book, but has a lot of ways and methods of reasoning about distributions and kind of can get you, bring you back into believing that there are ways to be fair that are, that have guarantees.
that aren't hackable. They're, they're mathematically sound. So you can reason about them and all that. Um, and then um, the sustainab uh, sustainability of common pool resources. We already said that we have a, a tension as being something that is a common pool resource. Um, it can be abused or what have you. Eleanor Orfstrom is a great uh, book about that, Governing the com Commons. Um, goes over all of the different edge cases and um, paradoxes. Now, let's talk about participation again. If you don't get to decide on where the surplus goes, then it's exploitation. If you worked on the uh, product, like if you worked on it open source. So pseudo participation, different types of participation. We got Carol Pateman, participation and democratic theory. All right. Uh, Pseudo participation is essentially uh, a persuasion technique. Maybe you give people information and um, they feel like they're part of the system and then uh, you move on to so somebody else that makes a decision. It's not the same as what we're gonna talk about here, partial participation. Pseudo doesn't have influence. It isn't um, going back and forth. It's just here's some information, let's go. Partial participation is kind of like, you know, your parent saying it's time to go to bed and you say, no, I don't want to go. And you, you know, pout or whatever. And they listen and you hear all that. I want to watch Star Trek, whatever. And then they're like, okay, now it's eight o'clock. It's time to go to bed. Right. So that's, that's partial participation. That's what happens. You know, oftentimes when people think that they're in part of a, a company or project or what have you, and they think, oh, we, you know, we're, we're very democratic here. No, right? Well, partially, right? And full participation is when everyone has the exact same power to make decision making. Uh, keep bringing this up because you need the exact same power, full power, in order to not be exploited when you're talking about that surplus. Now, um, we're almost to where we're doing this case study. So information and decision making, again, we talked about information before, but information asymmetries, we have a bunch of slides on this. That is where a lot of exploitation happens. You can have the power, full participation capability, but if you don't have the information, you still cannot, you can't make an informed decision. So you still can be exploited. So it's also part of it. Now. Here are, here's a model that we used for critiquing different open source projects. Um, we have the open source project itself. So that's the GitHub project or wherever it is you're hosting. Then you have the nonprofit, right? It, it normally, right? You can have this project and these are mature projects. Um, basically you donate the rights for the trademark and all these other things to the nonprofit. And it has all types of benefits that can go with that. Um, basically, one of them, you are not one getting sued is a nonprofit if you're doing something. And then you have a services company. These uh, sometimes emerge because people in the community, enterprises and community want one throat to choke. They want one place to go and say, implement it for me. I don't want to learn anything, just implement it. And you know, you have that and, and you know, it's what has emerged. Then you have the community, and we did a talk last year about the um, what I call the open source demos. But basically, who is it that should have the right to vote within an open source community? And so that has its own um, boundary conditions and all of these other things. But reasoning about the users, so the contributors and the users, is another part of how I think when you're talking about exploitation, you have to include all of these structures. So now we got Fedora, our first uh, case study. So open source project, we're gonna use that model you just said. Open source project, Fedora project. Some of this may be dated. We got some of this from the Jonah Bacon and from other sources. A community-based operating system, Red Hat employees make up 35%. And then you got 2000 contributors unaffili unaffiliated with the members of the, um, Oh, they are unaffiliated members of the community, unaffiliated with Red Hat. So yeah, that sounds decent. Um, the open source services company, that's gonna be Red Hat now, IBM. And it's for-profit C Corporation. I would say that 
the decision making structure within the services company is going to be hierarchical and it's not going to be full participation, maybe pseudo, maybe partial. Now you got the uh, open source found foundation, at least at one point there was an informal council. Uh, I think it might be changed now, selected by Red Hat. And at one point it was nine seats, four were appointed by Red Hat. Um, and so that's another uh, portion. So if you, oh, and then let's go to the users. Then you have po mainly power users, people who are familiar with Linux. They want to get the edge, the latest and greatest packages, these types of things, individual users, enterprise users, right? So on, on this, as far as a uh, critique, when you want, if you're trying to say you don't want exploitation, there's a couple things here that you could tease out. So what, what, as far as attention, what's, what's happening there? What, is there any place where if you are a war, if you are a developer, you should have a certain amount of decision-making capability in how the, um, the conferences are put together. If there's a conference for Fedora, that type of thing, who is it that gets to speak? Is it, if it, if that's decided by an informal council and it's not representative of you, then that's going to be exploitation on that asset of, um, attention. If there are donations that go there, I don't know, but all of that, if you are a, someone who works towards that, you should have participatory decision-making power on that, that kind of thing. So this is kind of the first kind of easy one to critique. And now we're going to move, we're going to have to do a little bit of priming the pump on before we get into the next one, because it's going to be a, a deep dive. Uh, information asymmetry. So we have stock markets, commodity exchanges. This is Bruce uh, Schneider in a hacker's mind. He's critiquing and talking about how hackers use information on markets. And uh, within markets, um, hackers use, th that's their main capability, information asymmetries. That's also the same with for professional managerial class really it's, it's kind of one of their superpowers. And really, if we're talking about us, it's really one of our superpowers trying to make it to where if you are, if people do have the ability to make a decision and invest in something, do something, try to make it to where you have more information than, than they do, or they have false information, that kind of thing. That's going to be important for what we're getting in here. And let me stop here. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, let's go. What's that? When you get to the example, I expect that's not necessary. No. All right, let's go here. So on the tale of information asymmetry, um, if you all have heard of the 1929 stock market crash that basically wiped 89% of equity investors' um, investments, that led to the downfall and the participation, precipitation of the Great Depression. And a year after that, well, in 1933, the Securities Act was created. And what this was, was basically Congress came together and they said, look, we cannot have this happen again. So they established some rules. If investors needed to receive uh, financial and other significant information concerning the securities, and they also wanted to prohibit the deceit, misrepresentation, and other fraud that could happen by disclosure of this accurate financial information from these companies to, um, to the government by registration of those securities. So, um, and a few years later, about 15 years, um, there was a company called Howie Co. And this was a citrus grove that had orange trees essentially and they had a whole bunch of land and what they were doing was they were just slicing and dicing the land and they were selling it off to people and they were saying hey look the oranges that are sitting on this land we'll sell it for you so essentially they were selling the land and selling the oranges for them and 
the investors really didn't have much insight into this. And the SEC came in and said, this sounds a lot like a security. So with that being said, they established what an investment contract is. It is a contractor scheme that is deemed to have an investment of money and a common enterprise with the expectation of profit from the essential efforts of others. So let me just before. So one of the things that's important about this is the the transgression, the problem was people weren't having enough information when they decide to like the 1920s or like late 1920s, they had this crash. People were investing in things and they were either being duped by inf misleading information or they're, or they weren't getting informed enough. And the Howie test is one of those things where they said, okay, this is where we say we need to enforce that the people that are participating in this market are going to have more or need more information or a certain set of information. So, I, I, so yeah, on this part, we're going to use the, the model again, you have the open source project, telegram, a lot of people may, people may not know telegrams, open source is uh, GPL. And you have the, uh, the services company. This is the telegram group Inc and ton issuer Inc. These, we got these from the, uh, court documents, uh, from their court case with the sec, the governance structure is traditional business hierarchical structure, um, with the Dorov brothers on the top. They funded this whole thing, uh, telegram, the servers and everything out of their own pockets. Uh, then they had a foundation. Uh, town foundation ton foundation sorry and the uh, telegram stated an, an intention to create a nonprofit, um and where and and the scheme that they were doing where it became a security is they started issuing and minting tokens and uh at some point in time i mean uh brand's going to talk about this at some point in time they were going to move everything that was surplus or whatever whatever over to the uh, foundation. Of course, the foundation, the directors are the Dorov brothers. So they have full control. So on this, there's no, uh, okay, so let's go to community, 300 million users a month of Telegram. It's huge. And there's Telegram developers as well. But as far as talking about people who work on, this might be a good place to dig into it, people who work on the, the project, these developers, of course, they were uh, in a hierarchical structure. It's not full participation. But <clears throat> there's an argument <clears throat> to be made that within open source, the users, they're also contributors. They are, at the very least, affected interests, definitely in a situation where um, they're going to be offered securities or investments, their affected interests. But no... Um, full participation inside of decision-making for these structures for the nonprofit or for the, the business or higher structure. Go ahead. Uh, Brandon. Yeah. Yeah. So the number isn't necessarily up here, but this trend, the investment in telegrams, grams coins, this was a $1.9 billion dollar investment where they had solicited funds from accredited investors or sophisticated investors. Um, there was 175 of them. Um, at this point, they were going to have the investors put the money in um, to basically tons grams offering, and then they were going to develop the coins and issue them to the investors at a later date. The problem was the investors plan on seeing their profit by issuing these in the public markets to investors who were not necessarily sophisticated. And this was not ran by the SEC. So for a $1.9 billion investment, or 1.7, excuse me, the SEC was not gonna let this fly. Um, they ended up owing an $18 million fine and they had to return $1.2 billion in funding because 
it just wasn't documented anywhere. And they tried so many different ways of bouncing through loopholes, saying that, you know, this, this isn't necessarily a security. It's just like any other cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it, I think main point, the secondary, the primary market, these credit investors, SEC is like, yeah, you, you all are, are adults. Go ahead and you can invest, lose your money. Um, but, and there's an exemption and it's allowed, but the secondary is regular people and they weren't given all the financial statements, all the other things, these people are crooks, whatever it is that's on there that would need to happen in say a public offering or whatever. Um, and so they said, no way we got you. Uh, so now let's move on to the next. So this open oh, the CNF test suite. So the cloud native network function test suite, this is a project that I founded as part of CNCF and it was part of Linux Foundation. It is, it tests, let's say, cloud native maturity for telecommunications projects. Um, we, with the uh, the services company, there's a cooperative, there's a cooperative that I'm a part of. Uh, the decision structure there is one person will vote, all that stuff, full participation. The foundation, the Linux Foundation, that's a nonprofit decision making structure. Uh, there's really two levels for projects that are in Linux Foundation. You have a governance level, right? So a governing board uh, that's not worker directed. Um, as far as if you are contributing to a project or what have you, uh, do you get full participation and even like voting for who's going to be on the board? It's decidedly reduced. Uh, and then you have the open source project level. So there you have working groups, say, um, special interest groups, these types of things. For those uh, groups, each project decides how to do its own decision making, all that stuff like that. Um, but oftentimes those are not worker directed as, as well. Um, because some of, basically people are just ignorant of how maybe democracy works or what have you. Uh, and I'll give uh, some background, which is unique to this space. So telecommunications, normally we're used to open source where the vendor, maybe the services company or whatever, that's the big Goliath or whatever, the user is small. In this project, the users are massive. It's AT&T, Verizon, multi-billion dollar companies, and they buy, right? So those service companies, they buy equipment from another massive group. So say for mobile, it would be Ericsson or Nokia. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, these are Titans fighting, but you still end up having this dynamic of the users at a disadvantage because we don't, users in open source are contributors and all that. They should be allowed to do things like um, have a, what I would say maybe a veto vote if you're on a project that is regulatory, like saying, hey, this project, you know, we tested this, doesn't work at all whatsoever. Um, the user should be like that, te those tests that said that are valid. Uh, but there are ways to forestall that, stop that kind of thing, especially when, you know, uh, and, and, you know, taking a step back, the way that things attention, so conferences, how they're put together, who gets to speak, who gets to say, this test is a good test, that test, or this law is a good law, this regulation is a good regulation, right? And this project's um, uh, history, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, <clears throat> kind of things put into like with talks and things where they were, where they, where it was put in with like big companies and things where they would say, Hey, this test is invalid. If you, um, are working on a telecommunications project or a, a mobile, uh, software that goes into, a, a mobile tower, um, you can't really do those tests because we have to be more high performant and all these other stuff. And <clears throat> you go and you can go make a, a whole full example with the whole community behind it and saying, no, we want this test. All the users, those big groups, I said, at t Verizon, they're like, yeah, we want to do that. But through filibuster, through who is it that gets to, um, decide if a, if a, if, um, like say a sub conference even moves forward, 
a bunch of other things, uh, all that stuff can be hindered, right? You don't have full participation. So you have, this is exploitation of the attention, this is exploitation of um, donations and all that, that happens um, here, right? So you really, point being, you need to have full participation in decision-making on all of these things. You need it in the services company, you need it in the nonprofit, you need it also in the community working groups. It, otherwise, there's just gonna be exploitation there, right? And then a little uh, final uh, thing about professional managerial class and information asymmetry. You got a controversial philosopher here, uh, Slavoj Zizek, but one of the things, that resonates with me when he talks about rules, three sets of rules. You have one set of rules that are classification where let's say it's grammar. We kind of don't really think about grammar. It's kind of unconscious, uh, but it's there. And then you have another set of rules where it's, it's a prohibition, but you're, but it's also con unconscious of it, but uh, it, it creeps up, it haunts you, it pops up on you. So something like, go on to the uh, elevator and face the wrong way. You kind of don't realize, may not realize, oh, I'm not supposed to do this until everyone's looking at you, right? But then there's a last rule, which is kind of maybe hard to, to reason about. Uh, it's a type of rule where you can't be known to know it. It's an obscene rule. So what would be an example? Uh, one example would be saying, you know, how are you today? Uh, you're not actually supposed to answer that truthfully. You're not. If you, someone says, how are you today? And you say, well, I have a diarrhea, <laughs> right? You broke the rule, but that's not the problem. The problem is me saying that that's what's obscene. Me saying this is a rule is obscene. Why? Because basically it's saying, yeah, we're lying. We're all lying. I'm not, we're not supposed to admit that there will, there's somebody in here who's like, I always tell people somebody's thinking that, right? <laughs> um, that is what makes exploitation work. The information asymmetries one way or, or uh, it's kind of the battery for it is you can't point it out. Everything, these case studies are kind of obscene. Some of the talking about exploitation, talking about, hey, you know, this person that, you know, this employer here, they seem, you know, whatever, name your favorite employer. Well, they don't seem like a bad, you know, no, they're exploiting. It's obscene to point all that. All of that is the, the biggest problem or one of the biggest problem as far as information asymmetry, promoting or talking about this kind of thing, the, it's very difficult to do. So you have some people know and some don't. And professional managerial class, consciously or unconsciously, you know, that's to their advantage, right? So a quick, you know, you've got a couple minutes, a uh, way to describe how to exploit open source. You got the professional managerial class, you got implicit rival assets, so people not being able to even think about or reason about or know what the assets are, so like intention. Information asymmetries, you just talked about that. Pseudo and partial participation, as far as um, talking about decision-making uh, power over the surplus. And you got the dark triad, so as far as you when you start to get more mature in your exploitation, you implement one of those three. And then the examples, you can't even talk about the examples that are within exploitation because they're inappropriate, right? Um, that's really it. So conclusion, more entities should become uh, democratic. So you have nonprofit cooperatives. There's a such thing. Credit unions are cooperatives. It's one person, one vote, and they're nonprofit. Credit unions are not. So you have an example right there. Service companies can be cooperatives. You don't want to make a cooperative, whatever, whatever you want to call it. One person, one vote, full participation in people to sign on the uh, surplus. And then be a class trader. What does that mean? <laughs> I see some people know that one, 
right? So class, the class isn't your intent. It's the fancy phrase is material conditions, but it's basically what incentivizes you in um, materially, like your um, like money, lifestyle, these types of things. If you, we're all in this room, most likely everyone in this room, you would do better if you are a professional manager of class and you exploit people. Not ethically, not mentally maybe, but you know, a monetarily and all of that. You, so being a trader is you saying, I'm not going to do that. So essentially it's altruistic. Maybe it's definitely short-term altruistic, maybe not long-term over a hundred years or something. Um, so yeah, um, be resistant. People will want to recruit you into the professional managerial class, but always trying to, you know, there's always, uh, someone, um, ready to say, Hey, come over here. People respect you come over here and, you know, do the Jedi mind trick, but all of this is, you know, implicit, um, check your elitism. What is elitism? Um, um, let's say, um, Robert Dahl, um, and the political science, uh, professor, he talks about if you believe, um, that, uh, when you're, when you're talking about a group and making collective decision-making, binding, delegating collective decision-making power, well, let's say, oh, there's someone making nuclear facilities. I don't know how to do that. Let them do it, whatever. Right. If you believe that people have and will have the ability or do the delegation there, you're not elitist. If you think people know they should be forced to, that shouldn't be part of their ability to delegate the decision-making, right? So delegating to someone who knows better. If you believe that, that they can't do that, it's an elitist thing. And that opens the door to PMC and all of these other things. Like you wouldn't know what to do with the surplus if you were able to decide on it. So no, you, you know, so that's the pushback. You gotta check it. You gotta consciously think about it because, you know, it, it's pretty hard. Um, you know, and uh, rules-based cooperation, I think we're gonna have to start doing things. Things are gonna start becoming more automated. Um, you had Telegram that you saw, they were trying to set something up where there was gonna be a financial system with 300 people that they would be able to transfer. But the way to set it up, it was, I would argue is not rules based. It was hierarchical based by, you know, a person, um, the Dora brothers, I think what's going to happen, uh, as far as having uh, more fairness, is there going to be more, um, irrevocable type rules based contracts? Um, that they have to be developed in such a way to where they're going to be more of a commodity and not a security. And uh, a good book about that would be the block size war in uh, Bitcoin. Um, so that's one um, uh, space where the SEC looked at it and said, yeah, this is not a security. There's no, nobody controls it, that kind of thing, even though some people could push back that book would be a good one to see eventually something like telegram an open source project is going to happen and there's going to be exploitation if we don't figure out some of these principles apply some of these principles to it and it'll just be another like way more powerful uh way to exploit people um if we don't if we're not a part of that so yeah that's it yeah. Well, good. Any questions? You had one? They're all done? All right. One question. Projects, there is a master 
on a vault terrorist. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So are you saying trying to find out who should have decision making power? I mean you said there's too many people. Yeah. Someone dragging everything along. Okay, well <laughs> are they guilty of doing that because they're not sharing the decision making, but no one else will do it. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, if you're talking about what assets are you talking about, like on organizing events, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say, I mean, people, you know, struggle with this as far as like the, the problem that's the boundary problem, who all is part of the community, that kind of thing. And, um, it, I mean, things like saying, okay, people that are transitory, they pop in and pop out. Maybe they don't show up on working groups or whatever you make your rule on what it is at that point. And then the other thing is there's classes, again, people who are contributing and working to the production side, that they're called directed interests. They get to have full participatory uh, voting power. Uh, people who are affected, so, oh, someone's making a nuke in my neighborhood, I don't know how to make nukes, but I don't want it there. I want it, you can go somewhere else. That's a veto, and so you can, have that. Is that? Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay